What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. In the previous video, we completely stripped down this Dana 60 for the front end of my FJ40 Land Cruiser project. So we got this thing stripped down, we got everything welded into the axle, and we got our high steer arms welded onto the knuckles. Now we got to do the opposite. We got to put this thing back together. So first things first is we need to get paint on everything. So we're going to go through the axle with a wire wheel, this little nylon cup brush to get in the tight areas. We got to get this thing all cleaned up and then we're going to give it a quick wash job with degreaser after welding you get this like brown film around the welds and in the really tight areas you can't really get it off with a wire wheel you can't really get in there so the degreaser really helps clean all that off you don't really don't want to try to paint over that the paint is not going to stick to the metal so we want to get as clean as we can so quick degreaser we're going to pay an extreme amount of attention to drying it with compressed air. We gotta make sure there's no water left on this axle because it will rust. And then as far as the high steer arms and the knuckles go, we are just gonna sandblast these again. It's gonna be real quick. We already blasted them. We're just gonna touch them up one more time. Now, as far as paint goes on the axle, I'm going to be using some Eastwood chassis paint. I found that stuff is really good. I've used it in the past. So we're gonna do a coat of epoxy primer and then a coat of the black chassis paint. Now I want to add a little bit of spice to this axle so what we're going to do with the knuckles and the diff cover is we're going to do some Cerakote. I really do love Cerakote especially for these knuckles because we don't really have to mask anything off. The Cerakote coating is so thin even some tolerance areas you don't even really need to mask off. Now I'll probably mask off the bores where the ball joints press in because that is a very tight fit with the ball joints. I don't want any extra material in there so I'm going to mask that off but basically everything else is going to be just fine to spray with the Cerakote. The color we're using for the Cerakote is a tungsten. It's like a dark gray. It's the same color that I use on the valve covers and the timing cover and a few other things on the engine. So it's gonna really flow with that. I think it's really gonna look good. Well, we are gonna start off with some Cerakote work. So we are going to do the diff cover and these disc brake guards first. So we're gonna try to get these set up on one rack for the oven. We're gonna preheat these. Basically, you wanna bake these at 300 degrees for about an hour just to bake off anything that could be in this metal. If I see any oils on them that after you bake them, then you definitely want to clean that off and re-sandblast them and re-bake them. But I don't suspect we will. So we'll get these baked, we'll pull them out, we'll let them cool off, and we'll mix up our Cerakote. Like I said, we are using the H237. This is a dark, like a dark charcoal gray. It's actually called tungsten. So this is a two-part coating. Some of the Cerakote products are a one-part, but they are an air cure, which takes like five days, I believe, to cure. This H series Cerakote takes two hours to cure, but you have to get it in the oven. It cures for two hours at 250 degrees. So that's why we're gonna start with Cerakote. We're gonna get these coated, get them in the oven. While that's baking, we'll come to the axle. We'll do our primer. By the time we spray the axle out and let that gas off for like an hour, this first round of Cerakote should be done. So we'll pull that out and then we'll grab one of the knuckles, get that in the oven, get that preheated, get that painted, get it back in the oven for baking, and then we can move to paint on the axle. So we're kind of going to go back and forth with Cerakote and paint today just because the Cerakote, we're going to have so much downtime while the Cerakote is curing, we can work on painting the axle. If you guys are interested in the Cerakote, I'll have it all linked down in the description box. Like I said, there's two different styles. They have an oven cure, which I'm using now, or an air cure. The air cure is really nice because you don't need to bake it at all. It just cures, you just hang it out for like five days and it'll cure just as hard as this oven cure. So if you don't have access to oven, that may be the way to go for you. But like I said, this coating is really awesome. It's very strong and it's very thin. So like I said, you can paint threads, you can paint bolts with it, you can paint just about anything with it. It's an amazing product. If you guys wanna check it out, like I said, everything will be linked down in the description box. One thing I decided to do, I'm going to use this internal frame coating to coat the inside of the truss. Now, you guys know I already pulled the truss off and I coated the inside of the actual truss, but the axle is still bare inside that truss and I know I'm not gonna be able to get that really coated with just an HVLP. So I'm gonna take this internal frame coating from Eastwood. This stuff is really sweet. It's got this long hose on it with a nozzle on the end you can stick. It's made for frames so you can stick it inside your frame and coat the inside of the frame. We're gonna use the same thing on our axle here. So I wanna do that real quick and then we'll let that dry and then we'll move to our epoxy on this axle.
Well, here's everything we got going into our front axle. So we got a Grizzly locker. We got a set of 538 Yukon gears. And then with the whole install kit for these gears, this is bearing seals, bolts, uh, crush sleeve, which honestly, I thought these came with a solid spacer. If I can get one in time, I may buy the solid spacer instead of the crush sleeve. But this is everything we got. If you guys aren't familiar with the Grizzly, this is a ratcheting locker. So it's a mechanical locker that locks up under torque, but you can still turn. So when you turn your wheels, it actually has a little bit of give to it and it ratchets. So you can still have your turning. When you have a completely locked front end and you go to turn, it's not that fun. It kind of just pushes the front end. This is going to solve that problem problem and it's mechanical so there's no airlines there's no electronics with it it's fully mechanical the reason i wanted this fully mechanical one is there's not much that can go wrong with it and it's a very it's i mean it's made by yukon it's an amazing amazing brand so i don't suspect we'll have any issues with this now if you guys are in the market for a set of gears or a locker or just about anything else axle related go head over to eastcoastgearsupply.com this is where i got all these parts in from East Coast Gear Supply, amazing, amazing stuff. They have gears, lockers, install kits, flanges, I mean, U-bolts, everything for just about any axle out there. So like I said, if you guys need anything for an axle, head over to eastcoastgearsupply.com. Now, before we start, I wanna say that I am nowhere even near a professional ring and pinion installer. If you guys want a really good video done up, kind of a more of a step-by-step -step on how to actually do this and what to look for, Nate with Dirt Lifestyle did a really, really good video that I'm gonna be using when I'm putting this together. So I'll have his video linked up in the corner. If for some reason YouTube won't let me link it, I'll put it down in the description box. So if you guys wanna check that out, it's a very, very helpful video. Like I said, I'm gonna be pretty much playing that video as I do this install. He's done a million of these ring opinions. So that's gonna help me out putting this thing together. That is the game plan. We're gonna get this thing set up. We're gonna do some ring and pinion install. Hopefully we can get a nice pattern going and get this thing set up perfectly so there's no issues in the future with gear problems. Hold up, I spoke too soon. So actually what they send you in this install kit is a crush sleeve and pinion shims for a solid spacer. Now, I think what a lot of companies have done along with Yukon is instead of running a solid spacer on here, let me flip you around, I'll show you. So it seems like what a lot of companies are doing now, instead of running a crush sleeve or a spacer like this, you can see the entire shaft here is just probably just shy of what this crush sleeve is going to be. So we don't need any solid sleeve. We don't need any crush sleeve. All we need to use in there is these shims right down in here. We'll shim that. Basically what we want to do is take our measurement with our crush sleeve here down to the face. Now there's a shim down here. We got to pull this bearing off. There's a shim over here in between the bearing and the gear. We got to swap over, but we, we want to basically match just for initial setup. We want to measure from the crush sleeve down to here and then match that with shims. And then once we put this thing together, get the pinion and ring and pinion and everything in the axle, then we'll use a gauge to gauge how much drag we have and how much and if we need to adjust that pinion preload so that is the game plan looks like we're all set up we got these shims right there so we're good to go so like i said the first thing we really want to start with is this pinion so what we need to do is we need to pull off the bearing that is pressed on the bottom of this pinion now this is you could probably make something happen in the press with that although you would screw the bearing up i think now what i did is i bought a pinion bearing puller and it's going to help me out tremendously with this job if you guys want to check out any of these tools i'll definitely link all of it down in the description box so what we're going to do is we got to pull this bearing off we got to put the shim from this bearing onto the new pinion and then what we want to do instead of buying setup bearings because honestly they are kind of pricey and if you got a die grinder you can make them yourself we want to take our old used bearings and turn those into our setup bearings this is going to help us just put the bearings on and off without having to press them on and off because they are going to have to come on and off multiple times to check everything we need to check these bearings are going to be on and off so what we want to do is grind the inside of these bearings just enough to where it's tight but you can get them on and off by hand hand and I believe we need to do the same thing with the carrier bearings as well because there are shims between the carrier and those bearings we're gonna do that with all four bearings get those set up and then we can start putting this thing together checking our backlash our pinion depth our pattern all that kind of fun stuff
So what we're doing right now is we're checking the preload of these bearings. I, I made this plate here so we could torque this nut down. This nut actually torques like 250 foot pounds. We don't need to torque it right now. We just need it tight, but we're checking the preload and we are using this little torque wrench here, this manual torque wrencher. I don't remember what they call them, but this is uh, cheap on Amazon. This is an inch pound. That's what this is measured at. So we got a socket on here. And what we want to do is we want to see, you can see it's obviously way too light. Now we're getting like two inch pounds, if that. So what we want to do now, that should be, I believe that spec is like 17 to 30 right here. It's uh, actually, yeah, 17 to 30 on a new bearing. So we need to pull this back off, pull that pinion back out and pull a few shims out just to squeeze these bearings together a little bit more to get some preload. Like I said, you want a little bit of preload on these bearings so they're nice and snug. So let's pull it off, see if we can get that set right. And then once that is set right, then we can move on to getting the carrier installed and work on backlash, work on the pinion depth. So every, basically everything we're doing right now is checking, is to check pinion depth. That is the main focus. So we gotta get the, the carrier in and then we gotta run a pattern with the paint on the gears and to determine our pinion depth and that's what we read off. But first we wanna get this bearing preload set then we want to get the bearing preload of the carrier set with the shims on both sides get the backlash close and then that's when we'll check our pattern to check pinion depth Alright guys, got this thing set up. After a few tries, we are dialed in right there, right about seven and a half thousand. So right in the middle of the range. I am happy with that. Now that we're set up, we got enough pinion preload, we got enough carrier preload, we have the correct backlash. Everything seems to be pretty, pretty spot on. Now we gotta paint the gears, rotate the gears, and it's going to basically wipe off 
the paint that we put on the gears and that'll show us how the, the ring gear and the pinion gear are meshing together. Basically, you don't want that pinion gear running up into the, up off the gear basically or way down into the root. You want it pretty much centered on this ring gear. Well, look at that guys, that is what we got for a pattern. Now, if you look at this Yukon book that we got with the gears, you can see these are all acceptable patterns. These are all pinion too close. And then the next page shows pinion too far away right there. So you can see when your pinion's too far away, it's basically running up off of the gear. When your pinion's too close, it's kind of running down into the root. Um, but you can see all these acceptable patterns, they actually show it's acceptable to have it running off of the gear or like, you know, close to the edges or even running off of the edges. But all these patterns show, you can see it's, this is centered between the heel and the top land of that gear. They're all centered, even though they're running off that side or that side, they're all centered. And you can see mine is very centered. And then that's the drive side, the coast side. Let's spin this over so you can see. Coast side is also looking very, very good. So now that I'm happy with this pattern, we gotta pull it all back apart and put our new bearings in. Now, hopefully everything will stay the same. Hopefully these bearings aren't worn out enough to actually make a difference. I have seen people set these all up and then put their new bearings in and everything changes. I hope that doesn't happen. Well, right off the bat, we got a problem. I put my new bearings in and we got way too much bearing preload now. So obviously maybe those bearings are just worn out, but either way, what we need to do now is pull it all back apart and add more shims on the front of this pinion to space those bearings farther apart to loosen that up. I guess it's back to square one, we'll pull this off. We'll have to, I don't know, this front bearing was pretty tight. Uh, the other one, when I pulled it all apart, they came right out. So it's got a little bit of a press on it. So I'm hoping it's not too much of a pain to get on and off now. But either way, we gotta add a little bit more shim and get this pinion preload dialed in first. Well guys, I'm almost convinced it almost pays to just buy brand new setup bearings because after setting up everything with these used bearings, I haven't got to the carrier yet, but with the pinion, it was way off. Probably gone on and off seven times now just to get it closed. It just took for Ever. Now we're finally right about 25, 26 inch pounds, which is right in spec, right where we want it. These new bearings are gonna break in and loosen up. So I'd rather have it a little bit tighter right now. We're gonna swap on the new bearings onto the carrier. Now, hopefully this doesn't cause any issues because with these bearings being pressed on, we're gonna have to press on and off these bearings if these shims need to be changed. So that's not gonna be fun. Well guys, I'm at a complete freaking loss. I'm pissed off. This uh, pinion is way too close, you can see. Now looking at the pattern, now that everything in the axle is perfectly set up, we gotta destroy it all. So the problem is, is I can't remove my pinion because what these, these shims right here, which I didn't realize, actually for, to change the pinion depth you're supposed to use these shims which go behind the bearing cup for the pinion the main one here to get that bearing race out to shim it we destroy that baffle i can't find a local one so already we're out four or five days till we can get one in and then once we do that our preload's gonna be all screwed up. So we'll have to go through the whole process of our preload again. And then we gotta hope that the backlash doesn't get screwed up. So we'd have to press these new bearings on and off. And another main problem is this main big bearing down here was so extremely tight to press on. I feel like we're just gonna break it trying to press it off. Well guys, at this point, I guess there's only one way to do it. We gotta order, we gotta tear it down, order parts and 
I guess, wait another week to get parts in and let this thing sit. We got to find something else to do. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear it down. I'm going to try to get that main bearing off the pinion without destroying it. I know we're going to destroy the baffle. This is what it looks like when you, when you smack it out because this is in front of the race. So you have to pound this out to pound the race out to get the shims behind the race. So we need to find one of these. I've already looked. I can't find one local. So either way, we're waiting for parts, but I'm not running that pattern. That is not good enough for me. Now, I think the main problem is using used setup bearings, but I've seen every video I've watched, everything I've ever seen is people take their old bearings and make setup bearings out of them. I don't know, I, these ones apparently just do not want to cooperate. And yes, that bottom bearing is pressed on all the way. That thing, I know for a fact, it's seated. So I don't know, it kind of sucks, but we gotta fix it. So let's tear it down, order parts, and wait for parts to come in. We did it guys, we saved this baffle somehow. I just used a screwdriver and I mean it dinged it up a little bit, but I think that's still gonna work. So basically what we gotta do now is this is our new bearing race. We don't wanna use that. We want to come over to our used one and this really shouldn't have that much wear on it. The, the races don't wear, the bearings usually loosen up. So what we're gonna do is grind the outside of this and use this as a setup race because this is gonna be coming on and off to shim behind it. And then we're going to press on, this is our new bearing. Holy crap, that thing was tight. Uh, but we gotta press that back on without this shim. And instead of shimming with this, we're gonna use, like I said, we're gonna use these shims that are designed to go behind that bearing race. So that's a game plan. We gotta press that back on. Now what I did do is I just kind of polished up that surface. It was so, so freaking tight, that bearing was. So I don't know if that's gonna help. I just polished the coating off basically. Um, but we gotta press that bearing back on and then we can get this all back installed with a setup bearing race with some shims. I'm, I'm not sure how much shims, we still gotta do a bunch of measuring, but we gotta do that and I'm going to use my setup bearing for out here to do all this setup as well. So we got this bearing race all ground up and it slides right in and out no problem. So now we need to measure the old shim that we had underneath the bearing. That's right about 50 thousandths. And I'm go I already know that's too tight. So I'm gonna take these new bigger shims that go behind the bearing race. I'm gonna get about 45 thou, maybe 43 thousandths worth of shims. And we're just gonna try that first. Just for a test, we gotta throw the pinion in, throw the carrier in and check our pattern. As far as I'm aware, we can adjust our pinion preload without affecting the pinion depth because it basically will space out the outer bearing and not the inner bearing. So I'm gonna focus right now on pinion depth, getting this pinion to mesh with the carrier correctly, and then we can move on to pinion preload. I am gonna make sure it is somewhat close. If it's way too tight, obviously that's not gonna work, and if it's flopping loose, obviously that's not gonna work either. So we're gonna get the preload close, but we're gonna focus on getting our pinion depth perfect right now. Well, now it looks like we are the other way. Our pinion is too far away. I cannot win with this thing. So I, what I did was I took out about 8,000. So I think I'm gonna add in about three. Let's try 3,000. All right, after a few hours of messing around with the pinion depth, we finally got this thing back about where I want it. So you can see 
before it was running off the top, but now it's looking a lot more centered. I'm happy with that. What we got to do now is press in the new uh, bearing cup or the bearing race for that. And then this still has the setup bearing here. I did check backlash. We're about nine thousandths. I'm going to leave that. Spec is six to ten. We're on the upper end of the range, but I still, I still feel comfortable running that. So let's swap out the bearing race, the bearing, and check everything one more time. Hopefully everything stays put and we still got a good pattern. Well guys, I figured I would save you from the boringness of pulling this thing back apart a million times. So after I put the new race in and the new front pinion bearing, everything tightened way back up. Now the pinion depth stayed the same, but the pinion preload was insanely tight. So I had to pull that apart like four or five more times. Finally got this thing dialed in. So finally, we finally have right about 20 inch pounds of pinion preload. We have plenty of carrier preload. Our backlash is at 8 thousandths, which is perfect. This pattern looks absolutely perfect. I am super happy with the pattern now. So we are good to go. One thing we do have to do is pull the flange back off. We have to put our new seal in, the pinion seal, and then use, we, so we have been using our old nut. So we have a brand new nut we need to put on the, the flange and then we need to torque that thing. Somehow we need to torque it to like 250 foot pounds. I did make that tool, hopefully that will hold up. Uh, but we gotta torque that and then we can go through and put the rest of the axle together. That means brand new ball joints, wheel bearings, brakes, uh, hubs, everything. It's gonna look amazing. I am so happy to be at this point. Hey, quick question for if you guys are really familiar with doing ring and pinion installs. I know I kind of have an idea where I screwed up. Obviously, it was something to do with the tolerance of the bearings, the used setup bearings versus the new bearings, and that just threw me for a loop because I set the entire thing up and then when I put my new bearings in, I had to go reset everything up. Now obviously the shim placement on the pinion was the, one of the big issues that we had to fix, but I'm curious if you guys buy brand new setup bearings, are the tolerances all perfect? Because like I said, even after I just swapped in the front pinion bearing from the setup bearing to the new bearing, that's the only thing I changed. It tightened up the pinion. I had to add like 10 thousandths worth of shims just to get my preload back. It was so tight, I couldn't even turn the pinion. I'm just curious. I'm just curious if it is worth it to go buy brand new setup bearings or is this just kind of a common problem with just bearings being out of tolerance a little bit and it just, I don't know, maybe that's just the way it is. But either way, drop a comment if you got some knowledge on that. Well, that's enough chatting, guys. Let's get this axle 100% back together. I'm excited to see it. Let's go.
You know that moment when you're in the middle of a project and you forget to paint something and you just decide it's not a big deal, I'm gonna throw it together anyway. I just don't have the time to paint it right now. Well, I'm at that point right now. We got this axle completely together and these axle shafts, well, they're all rusty. So I think what I'm gonna do is I got this handy dandy Pour 15. Now before you guys comment and say you're painting over rust, this stuff is designed to go right over rust. So we're just gonna brush a coat or two of this on these axles just because they're visible and you know it's not a huge deal but while the rest of the axle looks brand new it is a shame having these rusty axles poking through so let's take care of that and then we are pretty much done we got brakes and locking hubs and we are pretty much done with this axle Well, we are finally done with this axle after like four days of messing with this ring and pinion, screwing up everything with it, redoing it all. We're finally done, we're finally together, and this thing is looking amazing. It is complete 1000% with our new worn locking hubs. We got brand new brakes, brand new hubs, wheel bearings, everything. This thing is set up, ready to go. Well, if you guys made it this far, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I know this was a very long video and a lot of repetitions with putting this axle together, taking it apart, adding shims, taking shims out. There's so much work, labor work involved in setting up this ring and pinion, but we got to dial in and it should work really good. Well, anyways, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up right here. I hope you enjoyed it. Once you go smash that thumbs up button, comment, subscribe. We'll catch you in the next one.